this whole thing about the ecumenical movement, I got a, th a quote, this, it kind of fit very nicely when I was looking at some of the quotes concerning what happened, what's been going on, the sort of the difference between the old and the new ecumenical movement. Came across this quote, these, this article, so I'm going to quote, make quotations, I'm not going to read the whole article, but it says that, talking about the Afro-Caribbean Evangelical Alliance, the ACA, so saying what happened to it. What they're saying is that there was a project called the Zebra Project, which was come out of the Methodist Church. This then was changed to the British Council of Churches. From the British Council of Churches, they changed that name to the, the churches together in Britain and Ireland. So they got something called the Conference for Christian Partnership, which was established in the 1980s. It was to create a meeting for black and white Christian leaders, as well as encouraging sharing building between the black and white churches. The 1980s also witnessed the formation of the Centre for the Black and White Partnership in Birmingham, now part of the Queen's Foundation for Ecumenical Theological Education. The first director was the late Bishop Patrick Kilimobi, a Roman Catholic from Malawi, which I find interesting that they were so desperate to get these Catholic bishops in what they were doing. And so what you had from that movement, they formed some called the Western Indian Evangelical Alliance, and that was in 1984. And then that then changed because it says that Clive Kelver was the general director of the Evangelical Alliance and Dave Tomlinson was the key of the house church leaders in the 1980s. What's interesting is that Dave Tomlinson was one of the people who is responsible for, I think it's Together for the Harvest and other, he's involved with that and other groups, but then they're promoting people like John Manuel and Steve Chalk. Steve Chalk, oh dear, he's controversial, isn't he? Well, Steve Chalk is the only one of the biggest advocates for gay marriage in, in the evangelical church. His idea is to take a pro homosexual position. He's got a church in Westminster, has he? Waterloo, I believe so. Something like that? Yes, he's South London. Said of Oasis Trust, but he's, uh, he's Jewish in, from what he was saying in some of the interviews. So it says, one of the work of churches again in Britain Island, because it was formed into that, that's what it became known as eventually, it says, but some of the evangelical churches were not comfortable with some of the church membership of the CTBI. Now what we have to understand is that the CTBI, Church Together in England and Ireland, in Britain and Ireland, is a sister organisation to the World Council of Churches. It says, they did not sign up to part of CTBI, but the two organisations seem to fill the gap of some of these evangelical churches, which are the Street Pastors Initiative and the Glow Day Prayer Movement. Both in the 2000s have managed to attract black and white churches working together. The re what they mean by that is Catholic, Evangelical, Presbyterian and so on. The reason for uh, the success is that the unity, in my opinion, has been twofold. Firstly, cross-cultural skills of the people up to such initiative. Both Reverend Les Isaac and Jonathan Oliady are excellent leaders and are well equipped in bringing people of diverse and cultures together. Jonathan Oliady said on film that he regarded the Catholic charismatic priest to be saved and born again. They, he, he goes as far as to call them his brothers in Christ. Oh dear. Uh, secondly, this the fact that these initiatives are not operating as institutional ecumenism, but rather see, achieving ecumenism through mission. So it's all this approach transformation is through mission. So mission becomes the main point. Ten years ago, the, the term mission was never used. It was evangelism. So that became known as mission because it's all about Catholics, evangelicals and other bodies working together for mission. The heart of mission. Social gospel? Not just social gospel but it's towards common um, Unity. agreement. Yeah, a Working common agreement. together. Working together. Yeah. It says, it seems that this part of missional ecumenism is a way forward for black and white churches. And this increasingly growing at a res grassroots level through other mission initiatives, such as food banks, uh, school pastors, and so on. 
missional ecumenism is definitely important. I think we still need ongoing conversations between different denominations. In this case, black and white church leaders. It says the ecumenical credentials of its director, Reverend Yami Adiji. He's the leader of the redeemed Christian Church of God. And he attends all these ecumenical gatherings because the, the point is, it's to bring us back together, uh, what they, they want, a one united church. Under they, the Pope. That's under the Pope, that's what they want. Interesting enough, they've got involvement of Richard Foster from Ipfus. Richard Foster promotes contemplative worship. Contemplative worship is a form of state of meditation. So you don't study the word, you live the word, you breathe in, it's part of you. So it's experiencing God in your or his divine nature within your spirit. He advocates Catholic mystical study. Mysticism, the, yes. The old mystics, yes. such as John of the Cross, for yeah, example. Yeah, and, and the Desert Fathers. Yeah, Desert Fathers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a thing I got which was quotations, and this was from Inspire magazine. It says, Thousands celebrate Pentecost and church unity at the London Prayer event. It says, The four hour ecumenical prayer extravaganza. So they had Monsinger of the Catholic Church, the Monsinger, John Armitage, who led the event and opened it in prayer, and amongst evangelical. Pentecostal churches which were present. So it says, this was Jonathan O'Leary said they were pleased to give strong support churches across the UK in this groundbreaking ecumenical initiative. He says, uh, Bishop Hawkins says, one of my interests is chairing the steering committee for the London Globe Day Prayer, which was encouraging new expression of ecumenism. I remember um, when I went outside Wembley Stadium, they had the Globe Day Prayer and there was a Catholic lady, uh, she had, was wearing her rosary beads and carried a cross and went into uh, to that. And she was saying, isn't it wonderful that Christians can come together in unity? To quote them, they, they say, I see this as hopeful new look ecumenism, which seems to be reaching parts of the traditional ecumenical instruments that have often failed to reach. So now Church of Rome is saying, we're, we succeeded, we're being successful, we're, we're finally got this counter-reformation movement coming to a head. Before this, you had the Global Day of Prayer and Worship. During it, it was quite well supported by the Catholic Church and I was handed out, I was given this leaflet because on um, the Ultimate Gold event, they were, in, I got it through, uh, it was handed out to me at the Ultimate Gold event. Um, Ultimate Dross event, it should have been called. Uh, it? Ultimate Gold, uh, because it's linked to more than gold. And so More Than Go was basically to support the sporting activities of the Olympics. Originally started in Canada, Vancouver, then started spreading throughout the world. So over the Olympics, they, they always do more, more Than Gold every year, which is an ecumenical event. So one of the things that I highlighted in there was statements that were made because it was saying that More Than Go was in complete conformity with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So everyone, all the churches that were coming together would have been in conformity with the Catechism. There was a quote from the Roman Catholic Diocese of Hetzam, Newcastle, describes more than gold as the largest ecumenical venture the world would have ever seen. They had the, the Salvation Army doing, they handing out cups of water because they believe in the social uh, aspect, doing good works. This was one of the things I picked up on. So it shows that there is sort of influences from Masons in More Than Gold, but also you have the Jesuit influences because the church, chief chairperson of More Than Gold was, was at the time teaching at the Jesuit college, uh, bio college in, in London. Can you give us a brief overview of what a Jesuit is for a lay person? Because uh, the present Pope is a Jesuit, isn't he? Yeah, they, they militate. Pope Francis. Yeah, Jesuits are responsible for militating Roman Catholicism. So they're like an army, if you will. They are a bunch of anarchists. But they've not killed anyone throughout history, have they? Uh, they have. For example, 70 years ago in Croatia, the Jesuit order, which was in control of the Catholic Church in World War II, had what were called they weren't Nazi uh, concentration camps, they were 
Roman Catholic concentration camps. They took a whole village in World War II and killed 1,700 people, took their naked bodies and threw them in the river. The priest used to wear a glove while the uh, victim was hung up uh, by a rope. He then took the knife which was on, attached to the glove and sliced open the, the body of the victims. And that's from the low parts of the, around the stomach right to the heart. And then when they died in agony and pain, they took the bodies and that's how they disposed it. And so there was a river filled with dead bodies. There was the Catholic Church in Croatia that killed them. And this is only how many years ago? 70 years ago. 70 years ago. Wow. See, I knew the Jesuits were violent and they've killed many in France. The Abergenses, was it? Yes. Yeah. And, and other people groups in France? The Croatia in Josvanovac uh, never forgave the Catholic Church for what they did and people within that area are looking, want justice to accuse the Vatican for war crimes against them. Some of the, the priests that were involved did get charged who were responsible for the kill, mass killing of people there because they were taken to court but they want to hold the Vatican to account for what had happened. There's a documentary on YouTube that shows and um, if you, you can to type in search the Catholic concentration camps they were uh, different to the Nazi ones because they never had gas chambers and in any point it said that that particular concentration camp was worse than Auschwitz in Poland because these people had no conscience whereas the Nazis had some restraint but not in everything. It was stated that the main ties with the, ties with the Ecumenical Initiative, the more than gold estates of the largest global ecumenical initiative world to date, says together with Catholics, we are all evangelicals according to the book, Evangelicals and Catholics Together by Charles Coachman and Richard Hennis. Page 185, it says, nowadays it's usual, useful to find evangelical used to, as a mute substantive that gains its voice only when it's coupled to another. A more uh, clarifying adjective, according to these days, we have fewer and fewer plain garden variety evangelicals. What we have is a lot of fancy evangelical hybrids, such as radical evangelicals, liberals who are evangelical, charismatic evangelicals, Catholic evangelicals, evangelicals who are Catholic, evangelical libertarianists, evangelical ecumenists who are evangelical, evangelical feminists, young evangelicals and orthodox evangelicals. The concept evangelicals become so presumptuous, has enjoyed so many bad persons and have been unequally yoked so often with self-concept has broadened into that of a commune. So this is what unity is about, that we can save ourselves from any confusion. This is a self-deception because it's saying more or less that we no longer have our denominational boundaries or borders. We've removed the borders and we've come, come in more or less connected uh, with each other. And this is what they want, isn't it? A one world religion. Yeah. So that's what... Under comes, the Pope. That's what comes out of it. On the National Day of Prayer and Worship, we hand out these leaflets. We had, I think, probably over four or five hundred printed. And the questions we ask are this. Are churches together regional groups biblical sound? And then give you reasons for that. Would you come together for prayer worship and subsequent mission with Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons or Roman Catholics? Give your reasons. Is it okay for Christians to participate in the Roman Catholic Mass? These are fundamental questions that most don't think about when they go to these events. Those denying Christ's popularity, sacrifice is wholly sufficient as a once and for all substitutionary atonement for the sins of men. Are they right or heretical? Distinguish between evangelism and evangelization. Which one is biblical? Explain what false ecumenism is. Is a valid biblical unity for Christians? Is this ecumenical unity true apostolic teaching? 
what's its history. So I'm asking whether they have knowledge uh, of the history or background. I show from scriptures how the social transformation gospel saves. Another question was, can a born again evangelical Christian fellowship, worship, pray or minister with those who are not born again? In other words, those who have not been regenerated in the newness of life in Christ that is advocated in the National Day Prayer and Worship. Can you explain what to me what kingdom dominion is? Is it biblical? The particular type of teaching kingdom now is teaching at National Day Prayer and Worship is Christian restorationism. Are you familiar or happy with the eschatological worldview? What is the New Apostle Reformation, its roots? Is it biblical? The meeting today has influences in the last three lean exponents of the New Apostle Reformation, which was Ed Gerardo uh, Silverso, so its name shortened is Ed Silverso, C.P. Wagner and Bill Johnson. Do you agree with their teaching? Another question, I've got three last questions. What leaders do you believe the National Day Prayer and Worship is God's initiative for the UK? Jonathan O'Leary purports to have regular visions and words from God. He's not getting from the Bible, he's, he's simply getting these visions. The outcome is a movement operating contrary to biblical orthodoxy. Are you sure God is in this? Do you accept that ultimately you are a person responsible to test these things before God? According to 1 Thessalonians 5.21, the actual consequence of serious error will fall upon your own head. Jonathan L. Lady, we call him a pipe piper, who will answer to God. And the pipe piper was, the, in the story, it was a fable where he was leading the children away and then he kidnapped them. And the parents, when they were looking for them, couldn't find the children because the parents resented their own kids. The pipe piper saw that and saw, well, we'll take all these children off you. So that's what we call Jonathan L. Lady, a pipe piper. Do you participate, believe in strategic worship, spiritual warfare in the heavenlies? Do you believe that when unity through prayer evangelism, you can bind and take authority over territorial spirits, thus by frontal assault, take cities for Christ? Those were the questions. That, that and what kind of response did you get from I didn't get a response, I couldn't answer them. Uh, so just silence. So, so they didn't want to answer them. You'd think that if they were truly looking for Christ, they would say, tell us more about this. Yeah, Are we on they, the wrong they, path? they claim they've already got Christ. They tend to use the Bible to legitimise what, what they're doing. Twisting scripture. Well, it's, it's uh, the creating an uh, eisegetical uh, um, um, outlook on scripture. It's not eisegesis. Uh, it's it's eisegesis, they're reading it's into not it. Exegesis. Uh, yeah, they're, so they're reading not, into it what they want it to say. They're not properly defining eisegesis. the scriptures. Yeah. Um, so it's not in terms of interpretation, but it's, it's the clear written uh, word, which is very simple. Yeah. So it's they like to change the nature so it's more appealing and fits in with their agenda. Wow, Miguel. We've got Milton Keynes, the churches together fresh expressions etc etc well fresh expressions are the anglican and they were one of the groups supportive of the mind body spirit event at the cathedral um, that sounds buddhist no it's not it's basically occultism disguised in the name of christianity so new age new age they had thing the, like the labyrinth they had cheese deck uh, cheese deck was created by the same makers of the tarot cards so they believe by having the Christian form of the tarot, they could, uh, you know, when they give the readings, it, it will have scripture that's relevant to that individual. Oh dear. Wow. So they do things like crystals, angels, oh and, dear. and that kind of thing. They also have, there was a woman called Pauline, she's a Methodist minister. She admittedly, even on her blog, she, she, she talks about what, you know, why she is a tarot card reader. So she'll go into a cult fairs and she, because she wants to present God through the tarot. Oh. So you know you might as well use an Ouija board uh, yeah. and yeah. Um, claim yeah. you know that God can speak to people through it. So it's it's no different. They are uh, occult devices that 
that they're playing with. The, the sad part about it, the tragedy, is young children. These areas are often marketed for very, very young children, like Hope Together. We're also encouraging six-year-old children through Scripture Union to walk the labyrinth and, and, and do the meditation prayer. Scripture Union was involved in this? The marketing for six-year-old children. Oh, dear my cow. Um, We've got Scripture Union in Bletchley, you see, in Milton Keynes. Wow. 